uh, appear somewhere where you want to. Okay, so welcome to publishing your dissertation. Um, I think it's very, very important that we all think of ways in which we can publish our dissertation. Let's face it, you have invested an enormous amount of effort and money into creating this PhD degree. That PhD degree, and specifically your research, should serve as your springboard to find your career goals, to realize your career goals. And let me tell you, your dissertation will live for a very long time. You know, I did my dissertation in a different galaxy, in a different century, many, many, far, far away, in 1979. Uh, and I did it on research at Columbia. My subject was the um, architecture of Career and Hastings. You probably, nobody knows what that is. They were the preeminent architectural firm at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century. You know, that's, how, that's why America is a disposable society. You know, we, we, we lose track of these wonderful events. But they built, on, amongst others, the uh, New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue, if you're familiar with New York, that beautiful building. They built the Senate and House office buildings in Washington, D.C. And they built the Capitol. <laughs> so you would think that the name would resonate with, but anyway. I, was the, I had to come from Europe. I was born in Europe, as you know to write a book, I mean a dissertation about this seminal American architectural firm. And even though I wrote it and, 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 uh, in 1979 when there was no internet, where the only distribution medium for dissertations at the time was microfiche. That's the only way it's been distributed. Uh, I found out by accident that just in the last 15 years that work has been cited at least 15 times. 40 years later. So imagine, imagine the impact that you can have with today's technology. Internet, social media, uh, all the publishing formats that we're going to be talking about today. So you owe it to yourself to take the tremendous work you've done with your thesis or your dissertation and pour that and exploit that in all the wonderful publishing opportunities that you have that I didn't have when I graduated from my doctoral program. So that's what really motivates me in teaching this seminar. And the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what is the principal argument of your study? What is the principal argument of your study? What are you trying to tell? Now, a lot of people forget that, you know, when I chair, dissertation committees or work on dissertation committees, as Kim knows and Nicole knows and Fariba knows, I always ask the question, what is it about? What are you trying to say? What is your argument? And second, what are the unique insights that you have found? You know, one of the things, uh, I could almost engrave it on stone tablets and show it to every student who is going through the dissertation process. The one thing that students always neglect in dissertation drafts is the abstract and the conclusions. The abstract and the conclusions. They're always afterthoughts. Well, guess what, what do you do when you read someone's dissertation? You read the abstract, and then you go to the conclusions, and then you make a decision whether you're going to read the damn thing or not, right? These are the most important parts of your work. And every time I tell the student, where are your conclusions? Sometimes I don't even, they're not even there, or they're like half a page. I said, this is where you bring it all together and you say, what new great insights Am I contributing to the academy? Pull it together. And I know that takes a bit of a leap of faith in some of you and then suddenly become very modest, you know, oh, I don't know, it's the limitations to my study and, you know, it was just an effort and da da da. da. Forget it. Tell me straight out what are the new and great insights that you have created. And once you know that, then you can ask yourself, who would be interested in reading that? 
Who would be interested in reading these great new insights? And most importantly, are there practical outcomes? Are there outcomes, takeaways for the reader? And if so, what are they? What can they learn from my study that they can use in their own practice? That is the one thing, the other thing I miss in dissertations. We are so focused on the theoretical domain, and uh, no, it's important that we are schooled in theory and that you know, our work is nested in the literature, but why are we doing it? We're doing it to contribute to humankind. Well, what is, what is that contribution? Ask yourself these questions. This is the core of your book. Without knowing this, you cannot start a book. So what are the practical outcomes that readers can use, either academics or professionals, in any of the areas that we're working on? So what can we do to publish that work? What can we do to use, to leverage the tremendous work that we have invested in our research? How can we use that in our career? Because ultimately, that's why you're here. You know, you're not doing a dissertation for your health, you know. You're doing it to advance your work as a scholar, as a practitioner. So you can write a journal article, and I've given a lot of seminars about that. I'm not doing that today. Uh, you can give a conference presentation. I have a course about that in which we work together on developing papers for conferences. You can write a book, you can write a blog, you can write a video. To do it well, you have to write a book, and everything else will hinge on that. Your book is your calling card to the academic and the professional community. When you are the author of a book, you are somehow elevated to another higher level. And that's what a book does. That none of these other things can do that. When you're the, an author of a book, you suddenly have gained a lot of credibility. So what makes me so um, experienced in this area? Well, I try to dabble along. Uh, I've written, I'm, I'm not sure, somewhere between 15 and 20 books. Somebody's going to have to account it for me. Uh, 15 to 20 books. Um, and I'm, I have a practice where, with a group of artists and engineers where we have created electronic books for lots of other publishers. Uh, we did. Moses to Muhammad, which was to be did with Apple, which is one of the first e-books with embedded video, if you're interested in that. Every chapter has an embedded video as part of the e-book package, lots of other multimedia. We did the Marilyn Monroe uh, book in electronic form where you could look at her beautiful illustrated pictures, uh, embedded clips from her movies in the e-book. So uh, anyway, all of that experience I would like to make available to you guys to see how you should publish your book. Well, how should you publish your book? Why should you publish your book? Again, you want your dissertation to establish you as an expert in your field. When Kim writes a book about single entrepreneurs and the correlation between that experience and single parenthood, I want her to be the world expert on that topic. And so if there's ever a conference even remotely related to women entrepreneurship, she's gonna be the keynote, or I will want the reason why, right? And so that goes for each and every one of you. Leverage the work you do as part of a book. It should serve as your launch platform, and again, it will give you so much more credibility than just putting your dissertation in academia.edu or ProQuest. Let me tell you something. This is, ProQuest is where dissertations go into the wilderness. You know. I'm not saying anything bad about ProQuest, and it's a requirement of this university that every dissertation is deposited, I would almost say interred, into the ProQuest cimetière, but that's not where people are going to go to learn about your research. That's why it is incumbent upon you. And by the way, 
Uh, just because ProQuest doesn't, uh, has published or will publish your work doesn't mean that they take any rights away from you. I actually pursued at one point with my attorney to see, I asked ProQuest, what are the rights of my students when they, their dissertation is deposited? And it became quite a, a tug of war and I have it in writing that you own the full rights to your dissertation, even if it's published by ProQuest. The only thing you cannot do is you use their unique ISBN code or UMI code. So when you publish your work, you have to create your new and original ISBN reference. If you have a question about ISBN, which is very important, please ask me in the Q&A. Okay. That's the only thing. Other, you are free and clear. You are the owner and the copyright holder of your work. Okay, it's very important to know that. So, another reason why you want to publish your work is because, gang, the competition is growing. The number of PhDs that traditional and distributed universities are producing on an annual basis is growing. So, you are, on the one, on the one hand, you have many more opportunities for publishing, but on the other hand, your competition is growing, which is another reason why you want to make sure you're out there with a book, or multiple books even, as Andriana has just has told us. So this is the typical structure of a dissertation. I'm sure for many it will be painfully uh, familiar. <laughs> and it is the worst possible way to write a book. Why is that? Anyone has any thoughts? It's not interesting, yes. You are extracting key elements of the story and you're uh, putting them in separate silos. Which is why it's almost impossible to read. But who wants to read a dissertation? Let's face it, right? Now the reason why it is so is because for us as faculty, it is important that we segment these things out. We want to make sure that we, can, that we know that uh, Katie knows how to do an introduction and problem statement, that Charles knows how to write a literature review. And we want Will to be able to demonstrate to us that he knows how to craft a methodology and so forth. So this thing has been artificially pulled apart into separate silos so that we as faculty on your dissertation committee can say, oh, she does this well, this is done good. No, no, this needs work. Do you see what I'm saying? But that does not make a book. It makes a terrible book. So the key challenge, your mission, should you decide to accept it, <laughs> is to take your dissertation, extrude it, mash it up, flatten it out, throw it against the wall, and start all over again. I'm sorry, that's it. Okay, we're done. <laughs> How you do that is what we're going to talk about right now. But it is important, please don't just take your dissertation as is and try to publish that. Nobody's going to read it. The format is strictly for educational purposes, for our, our assessment purposes. So what we need to do is really try to recast the dissertation as, you know what, as a story. That's it. Write your dis rewrite the findings of your dissertation as a story. The story, Aristotle says, now hang on, this is a very complicated uh, definition, okay? A story, according to Aristotle, the, the fourth century Greek philosopher, is a thing with a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> end of definition. But so true. What Aristotle is saying is that there needs to be a common narrative thread. A common thread of logic. You know, Aristotle wrote a lot about logic. Do you see what I'm saying? We call it in the movie th uh, terms, when we produce movies, we call that a narrative arc. It has an introduction, exposition, development, and resolution. Okay? So that's how you have to think about your book. It's a story. 
You introduce the problem, you slowly develop the complexity, and then you work your way towards resolving all the terrible problems that you've identified in the beginning. Okay? That is the challenge of writing a story about your book. And everything else I'm going to share with you from this point on is just the, the, the technical aspects of it, which are important too. But it's important that we understand the essential difference between writing a dissertation and writing a story. What I always tell my students, as some of you know, is imagine that you're sitting down with your mother, or if she's still alive, your grandmother. And your grandmother asks you, gosh, Nicole, tell me about what you're doing there. And Nicole is going to explain to her grandmother what she has been doing with her. That's how you have to, doesn't mean you have to make it very simplistic, but when you do that, unconsciously, your brain will start to format your research into a story that people can follow. There are many, many ways to do that. There are books written about storytelling. You know, storytelling, in my book, uh, Archaeology of the Bible, um, I, I show that stories were the original containers of data. All of the foundational myths of the great civilizations, the Mahabharata, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Old Testament or Hebrew Scripture. They're stories, right? They're stories. So the human brain absorbs stories better because it activates the emotional part of the brain rather than the cognitive part of the brain. And that's why we become invested emotionally. And that's what you have to do. You have to become a storyteller. Do you think you can do that? You know your material better than anyone else. All you have to do is try to cast it in a story. Now, how do we, how do, we do that? Well, the way I'll, I'll, you know, I always believe that the best way to explain things is to show an example, to exemplify things. So I'm going to show you two examples of how we created stories around very complex material. And the first one, and we have two people here in the group who contributed to this. Oh, we're going to get there in a minute. I'm sorry. Uh, writing styles. Here are a few do nots. Do not copy and paste from your dissertation. If I catch you <laughs> copying and pasting from you, I'm going to come and wake sorry, you up. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not. Do not copy and paste. Because the, the writing style of that thing, you know, I, I, as you know, I'm the editor of Field University Press. And I, in the early days, we produced monographs of people's dissertations. And it was just condensed, or should I say, constipated dissertations. <laughs> crunched together. And there was no logic. It was just copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Do not do that. Start to talk about your story afresh with its own authentic narrative arc. Avoid long run-on sentences. I know I'm part of the run-on police, <laughs> as many of you know. When I see a sentence that goes for more than two sentences, I shoot holes through it. Because a human, a reader can't follow that long. I mean, it's, it's very easy to write long sentences. I think the longest sentence I've ever seen in a dissertation ran for half a page. Yeah. <laughs> and somewhere down the line, you lose track of the syntax or the meaning or what this is about, you know. I do not charge you by the sentence, really. You can make more sentences than one, okay? It's all about not impressing your readers, as you may want to impress your dissertation committee. I get that. <laughs> it's about persuading and inspiring. It's about persuading and inspiring. You need to inspire your reader. And to do that, you have to write in a style that is lucid, that is transparent, that is accessible. One of the, I found some pretty bad reviews of my books, but one of the nicest reviews I've ever had about a book came from Columbia Library Journals, who wrote, Isbaus is such an accessible author. What I write is accessible, even though what I write is about very dense stuff. And that's what you have to aim for. Make your text accessible to your, your reader. Okay, so here's an example 
uh, of a book that was many years in the making. Uh, I've always been very much impressed or captivated by this whole idea of an afterlife. My dad started this in me. And uh, several years ago, I started a research project to, with, on the premise of if there is indeed a biological way in which part of us can survive death, there's got to be a way to identify that through scientific means. It's that simple. If there is such a thing as an afterlife, it must be part of our DNA, right? It must somehow be a way in which we can address that by modern means, whether it's neurological or, 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 or astrophysical or quantum physics or all of those things. And so that's what we've done. And what you see when you open the page are these names, Andriana, Kimberly, and many others worked on this book with me. And so when you open the book, they are there. Because when students work with me on the publications, many students have done, I want to give them full, full, full credit. So what each of those students did is identify a very specific, highly scientific area. Very, very scientific area. And so when we all brought this together, the challenge was how do we work this into a seamless narrative, right? How do we work this into a way that my mom, if she were still alive, would love to read. That's our goal. And so we started out with writing a table of contents. And this is what I, this is your first exercise. This is your first exercise. So when you go to your hotel room and you go home tonight and you start thinking about your book, think about your book in terms of a table of contents. And the first thing you want to do is break it down into chapters. Just start with chapter headings, that's all. Whether it's six chapters or, I don't care, let's say 10 chapters. If you had to write a book about your dissertation in 10 chapters, what would the header of each chapter be? That's all, let's do that first, okay? Because that forces you to organize all of the data and findings and insights into 10 logical steps, just like Aristotle told us. That's the first thing you do. And don't worry about the, 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 the titling. I mean, you're gonna change that thing a million times anyway, but you have to start somewhere, right? Then when you have your 10 chapter headings, now write a little sub thing just like you see here, about what that chapter is going to be talking about. Now we're starting to string the beats together. And once you have that, now you can sit back and say, huh, does this make sense? Am I forgetting something? Am I addressing all of the things that my dissertation looked at? Uh, is this something, is there a logical evolution of my story, right? And that's why we did this. And we had so many different inputs into this book. And so with this table of contents, we were able to create a logical flow of all the material that we found. And of course, I then spent a year editing and re-editing and editing, but that's, we're going to get that in a moment. But that's how you start writing your book. Don't just open up a Word document and then you stare at that white space on the screen with that cursor, right? <laughs> Don't do that. Start from the top with your table of contents, then describe the table of contents, and then work your way from there. Once you have that, once you have that table of contents with these little descriptions, you are basically there. All you have to do now, and you, you feel good about it, you know, don't do it right away, but think about it. When you have that lockdown, you're almost there because then the rest is just filling it up, just filling it up. Does that make sense? Let me give you another uh, example. Two years ago, National Geographic asked me a completely idiotic, absolutely outrageous thing. Could I write a book about the history of the world, period? And like an idiot, I accepted that challenge. And hopefully, uh, in the next two weeks, I hope to finish it. But I started in 2018. But the first thing is, I said, how the heck 
do I capture 5,000 years of human civilization in 10 easy chapters? written for a very, very general audience. And see, I did the same thing. You know, and I crossed it out and I went through, and this is ultimately the breakdown I came up with. I said, okay, well this, and give each a theme, you know? Just don't use dates, but give each chapter a title that resonates with your audience. The age of faith, okay, we all know what that is. Age of conflict, the age of discovery, all of those things. Chapter titles are incredibly important things. And based on that, I was then able to break down each chapter into what I did is I, I wrote a description, then broke down, this is just a little blurb, we call that a little uh, summary of what the chapter will be about, and then I made a breakdown of all the points we're going to cover, all the points, a, a word count estimate, and any illustrations that I want to have there. This is what we call in the publishing industry a, it's a very complicated word, are you ready? A book outline. And it is the core of your book. So before we start writing, you want to create a book outline. And you can use the format that I just showed you with the Search of Heaven. You can use this format. If National Geographic knew I was sharing this with you, I would be in big trouble. But I have book outlines for other projects. If you want to have a full book, I'll be happy to send it to you of, of books that were published. But that is your first goal, to write a book outline. Okay? So, there are two ways now to proceed. This is where you find yourself on a split in the road. And as Kim just said, if you want to work with a publisher and an agent, this is what you're going to do next. If you don't want to do that and you go and develop the book yourself, which is an opportunity that you, which I didn't have, but you have, we're going to talk about that in a minute, okay? But if you want to go to the traditional process, which means you're going to create a book proposal and submit it to a publisher, then this is what you need to do. The book outline, which we just talked about, we all know what that is, right? So a breakdown of your table of contents and a description of each, brief description of each chapter. You want to specify the book. Typically, you're going to be to talking about a book of six by nine inches. That's the standard paperback format size in the United States and North America. In Europe, it's different because they're always different. But in the United, by default, we're going to talk about a book six by nine inches. Soft cover, paperback, uh, and the page count. Well, is this book going to be 200 pages, 300 pages? You know, typically, you, 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 you want your book to be at least 200 pages at a page size of six by nine. And probably not more than 350. So it's a sweet spot to be somewhere there in the middle. That's where your book is, can be produced in a very affordable session. This is very important. Next, you're going to tell that publisher in that proposal what makes the book unique and what makes the book timely. Okay? Kim can demonstrate with statistics that female ownership of new enterprises have been growing steadily. So she can say, hey, Mr. Publisher, look. I'm tapping into a trend. Always try to tap into a trend. Motivate the publisher's acquisition of your manuscript by saying, look, I am tapping into something that few people have done. Then talk about your target audience. Who is your target audience? Who's going to buy your book? Who is that? Now, of course, we can say everybody, but, you know, <laughs> you know we want to know. Now, these are these adults that um, have college education. Do they need to have a college education to read your book? Uh, could a high school education suffice? These are important things. Are there any things in your book that would suggest that a particular professional sector is interested? Are dentists interested in your book? You know, no. Okay, we know that. Here, then you could, you could bring it to your dentist and maybe get a break on your invoice or whatever. Um, 
who is this animal that's going to buy your book? That's what a publisher wants to know. And finally, do a comparative analysis of other books on this topic. And if you go into Amazon, uh, you can go into BookScan, or you actually can go into BookScan.com independently, and you can uh, uh, access the numbers of copies sold by your competition. Of course, you don't want to cite competitors that only sold five books, you know. Cite books that have been pretty successful in the marketplace, uh, but are really outdated, you know, and they really didn't get it. Of course, you want to show that. But look, they're tapping into a very important sector. Motivate the publisher. Let me tell you, it's becoming very, very difficult to sell a book. Uh, I'm, uh, I think uh, my National Geographic books have sold close to 2 million copies, which makes me one of the top authors there. And yet, this book that I just showed you, The Search for Heaven, took a year for my agent to sell it. And I'm an established best-selling author. The, the market for traditional publishing is very tough. Every time I talk to my agent, I, I had him on the phone two hours ago, actually. I, I always get the same story about, oh my God, it's so tough, it's so difficult, it's so tough. You know. So be prepared that if you go the traditional publishing route, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, I'm not, but be prepared for rejection letters. Be prepared for that. Okay. Uh, the other thing we're going to get that. Into, and by the way, if if you do uh, if you do create a book proposal, they will want to see a sample chapter. They will want to see a sample chapter because they want to know what kind of writing style you have. Does this person know how to write? That's what they want to see. So this is not something you can do in an afternoon. A book proposal really takes some time to develop. But I'm not discouraging you from doing it. If you really feel that your book identifies a hole in the literature and has a dedicated market and will be successful, by all means, pursue it, okay? That's traditional publishing. You do need to have a literary agent, as Kim just said. It is possible to address, to send your manuscript into a publisher called, but I would not recommend it. Unless your publisher is very narrowly focused on a particular area, sector, that your book taps into. Then, perhaps. If you're writing about new techniques for dentists, like you're doing, right? <laughs> you could see if that's a particular niche, you know? There are small publishers in particular niches, and they will sometimes have what we call an open call. But mainstream publishers always require an agent because that's sort of a filter that makes sure that that you are, are credible and those agents my agent receives I don't know how many submissions a week he's got several assistants who sit there at a table and they read through these manuscripts and they're looking for ways to get it off their desk because they have a stack to go through before they can go home you know what I'm saying so they're incentivized to reject it and that's just the way, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. You know, I would tell Peter, how many books and manuscripts do you use? Oh, don't even talk about it. You know, a big truck with paper always going out to the garbage truck every night, or recycling truck every night. So I'm not trying to discourage you, but this is the reality of the game in 2020. It's very different. You know, 10 years ago, I, my first book, uh, The Biblical World, which became one of National Geographic's top selling books had 20 rejections. And my agent sat down with an editor at National Geographic and over lunch she said, well, let him do an outline. And I did an outline, which was 100 pages. I did a 100 page outline. And I got the book, it's now in its fourth edition. It's been sold in other languages as one of their top selling books. So there are good news stories about this. It's not just all bad, okay? But be prepared for that. Um, and if you get accepted, this is important, if you get accepted by a traditional publisher, he will pay you, if you're lucky, 5% of proceeds. That's just the way it is. In the, you know, it's like that movie, um, 
what is that movie that I saw the other day where she says, you work hard so that we can make a lot of money. You know, what was that movie? Yeah. <laughs> yesterday, I think it was. Yeah, the movie, yeah. Lovely movie, by the way. Did you see that movie yesterday? Oh, you got to see it. It's such a lovely movie. It really is. It's about a guy who, who is the only one who still remembers Beatles songs. Everybody in the world has forgotten about the Beatles. And he starts to play Yesterday, and he's like, oh my God, that's such a gorgeous piece of music. He says, yeah, it's Paul McCartney. He says, who, what, what, what? They, they search Beatles and they get little insects on Google. You know, <laughs> they're hilarious. Anyways, that's where the agent says, you work hard so that we can make a lot of money. That's the publishing industry. Okay. Now, what's the alternative? The alternative is independent publishing. And there used to be a stigma attached to independent publishing. We, uh, back in the, in the 20th century, it was called vanity publishing. If you couldn't get through to a traditional publisher, you had to fall back and finance it yourself. That stigma is completely gone today, just as independent filmmaking versus studio filmmaking is completely gone today. Same in the music industry. The whole idea of creative people being able to outwit traditional channels and creating their own creative pathway is what makes the 21st century so great. You know, name me one studio picture that won an Oscar in the last five years. You won't be able to do it because there was none. They're all independent pictures. So independent publishing, independent creation, independent distribution is the way of the world today. And there are more independent books being published every day than there are traditional books being published by traditional publishing houses. So here are some, by no means a complete list, but some of the people, and the reason why I list these people, because I have tested them all out. So I have done book projects as part of Feeling University Press. I have done book projects with all of these good folks. And these people use a system called publishing on demand. Publishing on demand means that, unlike a traditional publisher, we're not going to run 5,000 copies or 10,000 copies, no, usually it's 5,000 copies of a book. So now we have a corner with booked boxes and boxes and boxes of books, right? What do we do with those? Well, we put them on a truck and we take them to Ingram's. That's a big distribution outlet in Chicago. And when a bookstore wants to order books, they call Ingram, say, get that book to me. So the book comes out, the box comes out, it goes onto a truck and the truck goes to the Barnes and Noble in San Francisco, puts it out, 50% is sold, 50% is not, back it goes in the box, and oh, that whole process of pick and pack, stocking, printing on premise, basically. That model is gone. That model is gone. I mean, some traditional retailers are still using it, obviously. But for the, by and large, Publishing on demand means that if Charles publishes a book tomorrow and his son or niece or cousin says, oh, you published a book, Charles, I'm going to buy it. And he goes to Amazon and he buys Charles's book. That means somewhere in the bowels of Amazon, there is a machine that goes, oh, Charles's book is going to be published. <laughs> Upload the software, your print disk image of your book will be loaded up. Brrr, a single book is published, rolls off the assembly line, there is a dude who puts it in an envelope and sends it straight to the customer. The whole distribution chain of trucks and storage and all is eliminated. That's the new process of publishing books. It's called publishing print on demand. We don't print a book unless there's a customer who's willing to buy it. It's just in time publishing. That's the new model. Do we understand that model? Imagine, first of all, the carbon footprint that is eliminated in this model. And is a much more ecologically sound way of printing books. So the challenge is, what can you do and what do you expect the publisher to do? 
What can you do and what do you expect the publisher to do? That is, will determine whether you go with any of these folks. If you want someone to hold your hand and do most of the work for you, you want to go with Blurb or Lulu. Ex Libris we've tried and I, 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 I'm sorry, I cannot recommend them there. They were one of the earlier ones in independent publishing, but my, my recommendation is Blurb or Lulu. You can also go with KDP Amazon, formerly called Create Space, but you need to come pretty well prepared. You need to know a lot about the book publishing process to do that. And then of course, there's a whole new thing called eBooks, electronic books. Right now, for every print book that is being published, two eBooks, I'm sorry, for every print book that's being sold, two eBooks are sold as well. So your dissertation cannot just be in print, it has to be in electronic form. Can you just repeat which ones you recommend? Okay, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show it to you, but Blurb and Lulu, we have worked with uh, at Field University Press, and Blurb and Lulu are both uh, pretty good, very reliable in their quality. Ex Libris is an older uh, publisher. Um, we weren't quite happy with the quality of the book that came out of it. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute what that means. So the distribution channel, of course, is because it's publishing on demand, which means that we are circumventing the whole retail system. Do you understand that, right? Now, you can get books in a bookstore. So if if somebody wants to, to get Marty's book and they go to the local Barnes & Noble, if it still exists, you know, they're all dying out, but if, let's say you go, and, and you go to Barnes & Noble and you tell the cashier, I want Marty's book, that person in that store can still call it up, order the book, get into the bookstore and sell it, okay? The thing is, we're not going through Ingrams or any of the major wholesalers, we're going straight publisher to customer. Okay. Amazon is the leader in this business. Yeah, we can hate Amazon, we can love Amazon, that's up to you. The fact of the matter is, if you want to do something, you have to go through Amazon right now. Amazon now owns 42%, this, this is data from last week, by the way, in Bloomberg, owns 42% of the US print book market, worth $870 million, and 89% of the ebook market. That's a shock because Amazon was not the first with ebooks. You know, that was Sony. And then came the Nook and uh, Apple uh, iBooks. I'm a big iBooks believer, you know. But Amazon owns, literally owns that market. Apple iBooks now only has six point, which is a huge drop because they were in the 30s just a few years ago, so they only have 6.3% of the ebooks, and I know why, we can talk about why that is, it mostly has to do with technology. And finally, there are, of course, it's not just Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble still has an online distribution channel, which is important. Most of the uh, people that I just identified will sell not only through Amazon, but also through Barnes & Noble. And let's not forget, for your book, University libraries, school libraries, public libraries, that is a separate channel. That is a separate channel. And that typically requires a little bit of an upcharge, but it's something that you can work out with your publisher. Okay. But that's, of course, for us, a very important market. You know, I went to set my local Santa Monica library the other day, and they had five of my books right there made me feel good <laughs> and it make you feel good as well you know library market why because a library sale is a lot higher than a retail sale because when you sell to a library you sell a book to be read by what 500 people so they charge a lot more for a library sale than they do for a consumer sale okay so this is the uh, ebook market you know when i started in this business the ebook market was just in its infancy and look at right now uh, Amazon just really controls that, that whole slice. There are small, you know, Barnes & Noble Nook is still hanging by their fingernails and Apple iBooks is a little slice. But Amazon, by and large, owns this space of eBooks. 
And you can see also that we are really a market leader uh, in North America compared to Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I mean, there that's a very traditional market. I was in Australia uh, a few years back, and they had, you know what they had? They had bookstores. This is a place where you walk in and they have books. It was amazing. They still have bookstores. You know, in, in Los Angeles, Santa Monica, that all the bookstores are gone. You know, it's ridiculous. It's wonderful. So e-books are incredibly important. All right. Are you guys still good? Can we still continue? Yeah? All right. Let's talk about the steps of writing a book. Now we're going to talk about the practice, okay? So we've done a book outline, right? We know what the book will be about. We know we're going to write it as a story. We're going to write it very accessibly. We're going to make sure that every chapter has a little bit of the unique data that we developed. There has to be a gold, what we call nuggets. There has to be a golden nugget in each chapter. But you have to string them along because you want them to read the next chapter. Don't give it all away, right? That's the art of storytelling. The first is you write your first draft. And that's, that's hard work, but you know what? I tell you what I do. Um, you know, I'm, as I told you, I'm right now I'm writing the history of the world, and when that's done, I have to go on the next book right after that. When you start writing your book, what I do is I try to write something, just one page, every day. Every day. And you know why that is? Is because somewhere along the line of writing a book, and it doesn't happen until page 50 or page 60, you will find your rhythm. Suddenly, you'll get the rhythm of the book. Every book has a different rhythm, I find. But you will not get there until 30, page 30, 40, 50. All of a sudden, it's like, hey, I get it now. I feel there's momentum. I, the, the, you know, I, I, see, I see how this is going to develop. And you have to stay on that groove. I literally call it a writing groove. So even if, it's, if you're on a train or if you're waiting somewhere in an airport or whatever, you only have half an hour. That's okay. Just for half an hour, go back to your manuscript, read maybe a few pages, tweak it a little bit, write a few words. That's all. But stay on top because if you lose your groove, you have to start all over again. Writers refer in many ways to it. They, some call it being in the space. You know, you have to be in that writing space where you know exactly what you wrote in the previous chapter and you know exactly what you're going to write in the next chapter. And that's, you have to cultivate that. You have to cultivate that. So make sure when you start to write your book that you plan a period of time, sometimes a couple of months probably, where you're able to work on it at least for a short period of time a day. There's one exception, I don't write on Sundays. I give my brain a break on Sundays. But for six out of seven days, I write every day, every day. And sometimes it will be wonderful and you'll produce, I never write more than five or six pages. That's my maximum, but maybe you, you can do more. And sometimes you know, you'll have a heart, that's okay, give yourself a break. It will happen. It will ultimately come out of your brain and allow that to happen. Does that make sense? Are you always working on one book at a time? Yes. I cannot work on multiple. Last year I wrote three books. One on Dali, one on the birth of America and history of the world. And I segmented it because every book has its own rhythm, Pauline, you know? Every book has its own groove, its own style, its own, its own wave almost. And that rhythm, you will find that rhythm, but you cannot mix it up. So I had to really block it out. They were done, those three Sequentially. Were done. Were done se sequentially. Yeah. So I did Dali first. I was done with that in April. Then I went to Birth of America. I was done with that in September. And then I picked back up where I was in 2018, History of the World. And I've been working nonstop all through the holidays. <laughs> you know, they had to call me down for uh, New Year's Eve. <laughs> the ball's dropping. <laughs> anyway, that's the life of a writer. You, you know, that's right. I was in a groove, right? That's the life of a writer. But listen, 
You, that's why you became a PhD, didn't you? That's why you want to become a scholar practitioner. Scholar practitioner is about writing. It is about writing, about sharing the fruits of your research. Okay, your first draft. What are you going to do after your first draft? Okay, get a beer. I get that. <laughs> what are you going to do after your first draft? You read it? Yeah. Not yet. Take a break. Take a break. Ask for Have somebody else read it. Listen, this is very important. Particularly on the search of heaven, uh, I went through five different re-edits because I had a, a, a large reader group and they would come back and say, you know, it's nice, but, it's nice, but, and slow. So your book, once you have your first draft, your first draft is not your book. It's the foundation for your first book. Give yourself time to edit. And edit based on the feedback from friends, family, husbands, spouses, wives, girlfriends. Sometimes I even show it to my dog, and you know when I the tail wags. <laughs> but seriously, that is a really important part of your feedback. It boosts your self confidence too. It boosts your self confidence. Am I making sense here? That's all you want to know. Am I making sense? Okay. So when you do that. Then you go and you do your final draft. Now, obviously there can be multiple edits. Writing is editing. Professional writing is editing. You will find yourself editing and editing and editing. And, you know, especially when you go back to your manuscript, the first chapters, you can say, oh my God, did I write that? Right? Because you were still fresh. You didn't know your rhythm yet. You were still trying to find your rhythm. But that's okay. Editing is a lot easier than writing. Okay. So, while writing your first draft, are you continuously editing? No, I don't recommend that. Write it out. I mean, if some, if what I do is when I start a new chapter, I will go back a few pages just to get back into the rhythm, you know? Oh, yeah. You'll edit a little bit. You'll edit a little bit, but don't get bogged down in editing. That's the danger, okay. that you start to get bogged down that you start to questioning things. No, no, no. First get your first draft. As long as we understand that your first draft is just the foundation, it's not the final thing. Okay? But having that first thing, you feel good about yourself. First is here, boom, there it is. Now comes the work of polishing. Just like Michelangelo. Now Michelangelo would create a very rough outline of David or whatever he was doing. Then he would go away to the bar and drink 10 gallons of wine. Right? And then he would Polish and polish and polish and think like Michelangelo, okay? <laughs> polishing, polishing and editing and editing. Once you have your final draft, now what's the next step? Very important next step, copy edit. And for this, dear friends, you have to get another pair of eyes. Now maybe there's somebody in your family or circle of friends who is a copy editor Maybe you know someone who's an English teacher or is really good with, but this is the one thing where there is an out-of-pocket cost that is absolutely essential. Why? Because you need a professional eye to check your grammar, to check the spelling. You know, I, don't, I, you know, I think I write pretty clean manuscripts, but when I get it back from a copy editor, it's still red. You know? And that's good. That's what they're there for. So please make sure that you budget that cost. Now, how much does that cost? How much does that cost? Typically, a good copy editor will charge, put you back three to $5,000. But there is good news. At Field University Press, we have identified a stable of very good copy editors who will do it for, at a charge of about, I think it's, we're at 1.1 uh, penny per word. So, that, which comes down to about, for a 250-page book, it comes down to about somewhere between $600 and $800. Now, that is reasonable. I'm sorry, Jean-Pierre, if the book is uh, published through Fielding Press, that's yeah. what you will charge. If you, charge, if you publish through us, we, we, that's our charge. We take it. If you publish through any publisher, yes. actually, that's not true. Uh, I published one book through uh, a publisher, I won't name them. And they asked us to, uh, to pay for a copy editor. That's the new publishing world, you know. Today, all the rules are out the window. Typically, copy editing, 
it is the responsibility of the publisher, but if you deal with a smaller publisher, then sometimes they will ask you to do that. Okay, and they will have their own stable of copy editors. If you're interested in that, I know of copy editors who will work with you on that rate because we're all starving students, let's face it. We're not the big, we're not Simon and Schuster, right? And so we have to work with a reasonable budget. But this is something you do have to do because you don't want to get a reviewer or a critic of your book say, my God, look at the spelling errors. You know, that's... Absolutely. And you need a separate eye set of... I mean, I think, I mean, I've been through Birth of America, my God, eight times, and I think it's crispy clean, and it comes back from the copy editor, and every page has red marks. You know, that's just, that's life, you know? We're not perfect. Okay. What, go ahead. I was just wondering, do you have, what's your experience with Grammarly as you do you Grammarly, yeah. Grammarly, of course, is just an algorithm, you know? I think I recommend it for papers, so I, I tell my students, you know, uh, if I see there are, they struggle with grammar or syntax, I do recommend Grammarly. It's great, not for something like this. You can certainly use it, but you would still need a human copy editor to verify. Do you use it before you give it to the oh, you can certainly do that. Yeah, but verify what it does. Okay, sometimes it makes mistakes because it doesn't understand what you, what it is you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, Andriana. Something. Copy editing. If you decide to go with a publisher, if it's a big publisher, they'll be important. Yeah. If you decide to go alone, can you do these companies that you mentioned for the company that you or that's your thing? The, the other the companies that we just mentioned uh, will offer those services to you, but at a at a premium price. Okay. So if we decide to go with one of these companies, can we give that copy editing part to Fielding as Fielding alumni or students? Or, or no, no, what, what I'm saying is um, I, the, the people we work with as copy editors at Field University Press are independent contractors. Oh, so and so I can put you in touch with them and you guys, and then you work your own deal, okay? But they are much more affordable because the companies I mentioned are obviously have a profit motive, so, you know. Well, yeah. and you've screened them for quality. And, and I've seen it for quality, yeah. And I've seen copy editing, right? Pauline, absolutely, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Just to clarify this process, we're putting together a final draft that we contact you directly and then you go through the... Uh, no, 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 no. When you want a proofreader, I will, I will send you the emails of people we work with and oh, you guys okay. go off and do your own thing. Yeah. We at Field University Press have a similar process, uh, but, but of course that we, we bear the cost of, of that copy edit if we publish a book. Yeah. Okay. Are we still good? All right, we're going to break in, in, in 10 minutes, all right? But let, let's just get through these steps, and then after the break, we'll finish up with examples of what these people do. Once you come back with copy edit, there is manuscript lock, which means that unless you wrote a terrible boo-boo, like President Trump is the greatest peacemaker on earth, <laughs> and then he starts a war with Iran, uh, um, Sorry about that. Um, unless there was a real bad, and I've had situations where there was a big boo-boo. Uh, spelling, you know, the artist in the InDesign process can sometimes create, write something. Never let an artist write, please. Never let an artist spell. Artists cannot spell. They have something about their creativity that blocks them from spelling. But, and they're wonderful people. But um, once you have your copy edit back, it's manuscript lock which means that you do no longer touch that text. It's very important. You do no When I get a manuscript back from a copy editor, I tell my authors, it's manuscript lock. Oh, but you know, I just saw a new... I said, absolutely not. Because once you go back into the manuscript and start putzing with it, it's contaminated, and we have to go back through copy edit. Right? So it's manuscript lock. Now what do we do? Now we talk about layout layout. And the challenge here is that you guys are all working on these beautiful machines and what is the default size of that page? Eight and a half by eleven. What is the size of your book? Six by nine. I, that's a, something I, all my authors at Field University Press struggle with that. Like, what are you doing? So the whole layout of your page changes, okay, to six by nine. 
How do you handle that? What's it going to do to your margins, your illustrations, your, your chapter headings? Well, that's going to be the layout process. I'm going to show you uh, how we handle that. Once your layout is complete, once you have it perfect the way it is and you've been through it a million times and you lie awake at night, but oh, this is it. You send it to whoever your publisher is or your printer is. Okay? And then you ask for a proof copy. A proof copy is a printed copy, one-off, we call it, a one-off, that is exactly the way you submitted it, but of course, then when you see it in print, first of all, it's going to look great, right? Oh my God, there's my book, <laughs> right? But then when you go through and say, oh my God, this margin is off, and oh, I wanted to do this. So typically, you will go through a proofing process where you may want to change some of the layout, not the text, but the layout, and then send it back. And sometimes we go through a second proof copy, rarely. But that's the process. And when that's done, now you go into your ebook development, which is an entirely different process. But there are ways to handle that. And as I just showed you, ebooks, for every single print book, two ebooks are sold. So you want to make sure that you have an ebook as well. And then we're published. Those are the 10 steps of production. Okay, uh, let me just do two quick things and I'll let you go for a break. The peer review factor. People always say, well, but you know, if, if you publish your book yourself, what happened to the peer review? Shouldn't there be some sort of an agency that checks to make sure that, you know, what, what you write is, is legit? Well, here is how you deal with the peer review factor. Ask your external examiner to write a foreword. Your external examiner is typically someone who has credibility in the field because that's why he became your external examiner, right? So always cultivate a good relationship with your external examiner <laughs> for that reason. And along the way, somewhere, strategically along the way, say, oh dear, so-and-so, if I write a book, would you mind writing a one page? It doesn't care if it's a one pager or half, who cares? You just want to have his or her name on the cover with a forward by, right? That creates a tremendous imprimatur that gives your book credibility, that gives your book the peer review factor. Second, ask your chair to write an introduction. Now your chair should be able to do that because otherwise he or she wasn't gonna be your chair, okay? So with both your external examiner and your chair writing something up there, now your book has credibility. Now reviewers say, oh my God, so-and-so wrote a foreword. Okay? That's how we, how we deal with that. Okay, Before, now we're going to talk about the technical process of layouts. And so why don't we get, take a five-minute break? Five, five minutes okay? Yeah? All right, so I'll see you back in five minutes. I'm going to get a cup of tea. Okay, the next topic is producing layouts in 6x9. And you want your book to look professional, right? You want your book to look professional. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna take something that you probably created in Word, nine, eight and a half by 11, and we're gonna bring it down to six by nine. Uh, and the easiest way is to have a publisher, a, a services publisher like Lulu, Blurb, or any other publisher, create the layouts for you. I'll show you in a minute what some of those services look like. And they have it categorized by template. Uh, and so basically what you do is you sell them, you sent, sorry, you sent them your Word document, eight and a half by 11, standard US letter size. And they will nicely lay it out in the proper page formats with a little header on top and a page number on the bottom and all those good things. Okay, and they charge you anywhere from $300 to $800 to do that. If you don't want to go through all the process and the heartache of doing that, this is what I recommend you do. You can also, sometimes these same publishers offer you templates and you pour your Word document into that Word template. But that creates issues. That's not a process I recommend you'll find yourself struggling 
to fit your Word document into that template, and you'll get frustrated. So if you absolutely want, you can use they make Word templates available, but I would recommend if you don't do that, just go and spend the extra bucks and have a professional laid out for you. The really, really fancy way of creating layouts is what we do in Feely University Press. If they have an artist create the layouts in Adobe InDesign. That's the same process we use not only in Feely University Press. My books for National Geographic are always laid out by an artist in Adobe InDesign. It's a wonderful program. It's very complicated. It's very difficult to use, but it creates these gorgeous templates, uh, gorgeous layouts. And you can move pictures and word and everything. You do whatever you want to do. Uh, Adobe InDesign is part of the Adobe suite of software. You know, right now what you do is you basically sell your soul to Adobe <laughs> at, uh, at an annual price of, God knows, three, four hundred dollars. So you never actually buy a piece of software. You basically mortgage yourself to Adobe. I don't like that format at all, but I do use their software. And InDesign is part of that, of that suite. This is just an example of what you can do with Adobe InDesign. This is an actual spread from one of the books, we, our first color book we produced last year with Feely University Press, uh, the book on the Mona Lisa, New Perspectives. And you can see what the InDesign artist can do. He can create columns and then put pictures and mix pictures with text and change the font and, and do wonderful two column pictures, single column pictures. All that flexibility is something you cannot do in Word. I mean, theoretically you could, but please don't try it because I've done it. I just, you know, you would have to put you in an insane asylum after a while. And like so, copy editors, do you have Adobe mm -hmm. Design experts that you traditionally work with? Yes, yeah, so I also have Adobe InDesign artists that we work with. Yeah, absolutely, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, their services are uh, not cheap. I mean, depending on, and, and of course, you know, if, look, if you just have text, there's really no reason to have an InDesign artist. Though one thing what InDesign can do, for example, is uh, have different column formats. So, for example, here is the main narrative, and you can see that's two column text, and then for the references, I go through three column text. So those are some of the tricks you can do. Um, Again, technically you can do that in the MS Word, but you have to be really good at it. Kim? I'm curious, so you had mentioned the Going to the 6x9 book, and you had mentioned the number of pages, the 200 to 350. So when you're typing your draft in your Word document, <coughs> um, can you say a little bit about approximately how many pages in Word, and is it double-spaced? is equivalent to not only a book, but the chapters, and also should the chapters be approximately of the same length? Right, so the question is how do you know what your word count is if you only, if you work in an eight minute by 11? My rule of thumb is that when I create a, a manuscript in Times New Roman, which is what I always recommend to write your manuscript, it's a very widely known font, which publishes very often uh, accept and request because it's you know you can it's very very common if you write a manuscript in Times Roman 12 point size at 1.5 spacing so not double spaced but 1.5 spacing at 12 point, point size then your page count in 8 by 11 will be equivalent to your page count in six by nine because that point that point size will drop to eleven. And then the publisher can do things with kerning, which is spacing between the sentences and spacing between individual sentences as well as the spacing of the word within the sentence, which is called kerning. Uh, that's by the way another reason why we use at, at professional publishers like University Press, we use Adobe InDesign because kerning is the process where words get spaced in a justified column, right? Word can do that, but sometimes it really stretches things out. Adobe InDesign has a far more sophisticated algorithm to make that look a lot better. Again, if it's just, if your book is largely text, these are 
tweaks, you know. I'm certainly not recommending that you use Adobe and design artists for if it's just text. But if you want to use illustrations and you want to just go the extra mile, I would, I would recommend it. Okay? Is that a, any other questions about this topic? If any, you know, we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, then formatting for, so this is print. This is all related to print. Once you have this process done, either using your own word or using service from Lulu or Blurp or any of those comp uh, companies that create the layouts for you using a set template and you can choose the set template. It's on their online system. So when you go to their website, they can show you, I'll show you in a minute, they, they have set templates that you can choose from at particular prices. Uh, or you use your InDesign. Once this is done, you have what we call a book image. This is the image of the book that will produce the final book. What you see is what you get. And that goes to the printer. Okay? Now, what about ebook? Oh my God. Ebooks. Ebooks have rules of themselves. And there are, and we only found this out, you know, in the process of producing our own books for Euphelion University Press, because ebooks are extremely delicate vehicles. Why? Because they have to operate on a great many different platforms, gadgets, iPhones, iPads, Samsungs, da 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 right? So it's a compromise format. And there are two principal formats for ebooks. It's called uh, Mobi. Mobi is Amazon's proprietary format. And all the rest of the world outside of the Amazon uh, Kindle system uses EPUB for e-publishing. EPUB, E-P-U-B. E I'll show you in a second. Uh, EPUB is the world format, standard format for electronic publishing. Anywhere in the world, any platform other than Amazon Kindle. That's the outlier. So we've done a lot of work in EPUB in my uh, practice. Uh, when EPUB first came out, we worked with a lot of publishers because we had engineers who knew to circumvent EPUB limitations around the fact that you could not have dynamic images. We figured out a way to have dynamic images and dynamic text at the same time, which is not officially allowed. Um, do you guys want to hear about this? I mean, uh, let me just briefly explain it. Uh, there's two ways to do an electronic book. One is to fix the layout like a PDF, right? A PDF is great because you can read it anywhere, but there's not, you cannot get at the text. You cannot make the text bigger or you cannot you know, click on the images and, and you know, sometimes the hyperlinks don't work. It's a fixed format. EPUB is dynamic, which probably if you have a Kindle or an iPad, you probably know that, like I do, uh, you know, you can change the background color, you can make the font bigger as we get older, <laughs> uh, you can change the font nature, uh, you can click on a map in an e and it will blow up to full size, all of the, that's dynamic text. So two formats, there's fixed and dynamic. We get that? Okay. Creating a fixed ebook is like, that's a no-brainer, you know, that's a PDF or whatever. Creating dynamic, which of course is what you want, because theoretically every word in an ebook is theoretically hyperlinked. Okay, that's what you want to have for your book. So to do that, there are rules. There are rules, like there is everything else in life, as your mother said. There are rules. Well, there are rules for ebooks. Here they are. You cannot use word formatting. Period. I, sometimes I scream at word. I mean, of course, we all have to use word, but sometimes it drives me crazy. Like when you want to create, uh, you put type one dot and you want to make a list. It means it's, oh, no, stop, stop, no, I'll do it for you, I'll do it for you. And it shifts everything over and, you know, drives me crazy. That is not allowed because EPUB will not recognize that format. It will not know what to do with that subcode, that hypercode that creates that. So any and all formatting in your Word document has to be turned off, off, off. 
and start that at the beginning of your manuscript because you don't want to write your whole book. Then have to go back and then <laughs> rewrite it, right? So use these rules from the beginning. Any and all word formatting should be turned off, including the automatically generated bullet lists. And if you want to do a list, type it yourself. Don't let Word override you with creating an auto format. Turn it off and one dot and write the sentence. That is allowed because it's not auto generated. It's just flat text or what we used to call ASCII text for those of you of my generation. Flat ASCII text. You cannot even use tabs. No, but I'll, I'll talk about tabs in a minute. Absolutely, Pauline, you're right. So nothing at all. Uh, things like paragraph, or uh, the word creates spaces between paragraphs, turn it off because that is code that the ebook will not recognize. Okay? Got it? The second thing is don't use footnotes or endnotes with numerals. You can use endnotes, but use it, refer to it by page. Don't have a little number floating there in the text because the ebook will not know what it, what is that? Is that a number? You know, it doesn't know what it means, that little number floating in the text. Yes, it's a reference to an endnote or a footnote. You know that the system doesn't know that. Again, EPUB is a compromised format because we want to be readable on a whole range of different platforms. Okay, so how do we handle endnotes? So first of all, no footnotes, all of these things we learned through publishing through Feeling University Press. No footnotes, but if you do endnotes, this is what I did in uh, my book, 10 Prayers That Changed the World. I just, on the back of the book, for all your endnotes, I break it down by chapter, obviously. And then I reiterate the sentence in which, for which I want to write an endnote. So just lift a sentence from that chapter that you want to write an endnote for, and you say, and you give that sentence in italics or whatever, and then you add the endnote. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there is not a numeric reference by entering that in your word, and a little, a little number will appear above the, we cannot have that. So it all has to be flat text. Marty. I'm sorry? You did use italics. I, italics is okay. Italics is okay. That's a font. That's a font function. Yeah. How do you signal in the text that there's going to be an endnote about that letter? You don't. Okay. <laughs> but you do say in your introduction for endnotes, I mean, if you want to say, and I don't encourage you to buy my book, but if you do, uh, in, um, in 10 Prayers That Changed the World, I did that. And actually, it is very, it's much more text friendly because sometimes for a general reader public, they will think that these numerals in the text look too academic. It's, it's... So, so in other words, we just put endnotes? Yes, in the end of, at the very end of the book. But you don't refer to which page they are? Oh yeah, yes, no, again, what I said, you organize it by chapter. So chapter one, chapter one. you want to write something about uh, something that happens in the third paragraph. Right? So you take a key sentence from that paragraph that clearly signals to the reader what you're referring to. You put that, chapter three, there comes the sentence. Um, let me just give you an example. You know, uh, the Hundred Years War, Hundred Years War was one of the most devastating war conflicts in human history, which is true. Uh, and then you say, source, do da da do 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 da, or whatever else you want to say about it. You see what I'm saying? So you clearly point the reader to what it is that you're referring to, and then you provide your endnote. It is a much more human-friendly way of providing citations or ref you know, that citation. References is not a story. We're going to talk about it in a minute, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? I would encourage you to do that even if there wasn't an ebook limitation, because I found that if there are in-text numerals to end notes and footnotes. People, some people are turned off by that, you know. So can, can you ask you a question? Oh, I'm sorry, Pauline was first. And then, okay. So what's interesting, I'm currently reading a, an e-book by Doris Kearns Goodwin called Leadership in Turbulent Times, and her end notes are all exactly what you just mentioned. They are freaking difficult to find versus typical end notes 
where you would click essentially on a number or a reference or something to be able to then flip back to that. So that formatting is kind of dissipating is what I'm hearing you say. The, 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 yeah, the type of in-text, yeah, direct in-text citations is this. I mean, of course, we're not talking about academic. If, if we want to do a purely academic book, you know, then uh, by all means, you know, have your APA in-text citations. A typical historian of whether, you know, people who are writing in the space that you're writing in, right. it's becoming like what you did for 10 prayers, which is right. interesting because yeah. it's not as easy. I mean, you really got to make some effort to go find That's them, true. Right? Yeah, and of course, one way to do it is to have the end notes at the end of each chapter. Right. You can do that. That's one way of doing it. Um, Again, it depends, it goes back to what we said at the very beginning. Who are we writing for? If we're writing for an academic audience, you can get away with a lot more. If you're reading for a more general practitioner audience, you know, the type of book that sits on an airport bookstore and you, know, you have a five hour flight and you pick it up, those are things you shouldn't be doing. Well, the word practitioner in that sentence is really important. Absolutely. Is yeah. your audience people who are academics, if the answer to that is no, then, then you can't do these things. <laughs> yeah. Then I'd say forget about APA and you know, really, APA in itself is such a unwieldy, horrible format of writing. And I say that because I come from the humanities sector, and in the humanities sector we use Chicago, which is a lot more user friendly and and kinder, kinder way of writing. APA is really very strict. But anyway, for academic journals, absolutely. The books that we're going to be writing, I think we want to get a broader audience, right? If that's not the case, let me know, but, okay? All right, I know this was going to be a difficult thing. Oh, I'm sorry, Patrick. Yeah, uh, do I understand you correctly that, uh, so I do a manuscript in Word that is going to be published in a print form, but then I have to retype this? Do you rewrite the entire thing? No, no. Put it in form? No, no. What I'm saying is, set these set these things when you start to write at the beginning. Even even if it's for print form, just turn off. All I cannot things. imagine a situation where you want to do a print book but not an ebook because the process is so easy. Right. Once, well, if you follow those rules, after you do your print book, then it's just literally a one step. To get it done into an ebook, and I'll show you how to do that. Okay, so do please, do please include your electronic version, Charles. Do you actually use Word, or do you use something else? I I, I use Pages, but I I found that publishers don't like it. So publishers don't like Pages, no, because their editors are all really experienced Word bunnies. Scrivener and Nexus Shredder Pro, those both. Kind of let you write it in print text, and then you can always. Uh, yeah, that's a little uh, using uh, ASCII type print. I wouldn't do that. I would, I would use Word because that's the the publishing world uses that. Even if you're working with a Blurp or a Lulu or any of those people, they will want to see a Word document. I haven't seen them accept a Pages document. You know, there, that's a wonderful thing because just one sec. Because unlike Word, and this is something that why I hate Word. After how many iterations now, how long has it been word around, they still don't have an EPUB export. For God's sake, what does it take? What, do I take a neon sign out in Seattle? EPUB! You know, InDesign has an EPUB export, Pages has an Word, now, huh, what, EPUB? You know, you kind of wonder, what are they doing up there? But that's a different story. <laughs> so, Word it is, really, I would recommend that. One last rule, indents. Of course, we need indents. Every time we have a new paragraph, we want an indent. Those indents should be set in the margin consistently throughout. So no tabbing. Don't use the tab key, because it will be rejected. OK, so if you follow these rules, then just from the beginning, from the very moment you start to write your book, you'll be OK for print. You'll be OK for ebook. OK? All right. Sorry to be so stupid, but what do you mean by indents set consistently? In other words, you are typing in five spaces? No, you know. remember on the top of, of Word, there is like a little ruler, 
and you can slide it over. When you do it, the bottom ruler is your, is your indent. I'm sorry, the top ruler, I was, I'm, top ruler is your indent, yeah. And you can set that for a quarter inch or a half inch, but every time you, you go to a new paragraph, so with the return key, it will create that indent for you. That is allowed. A lot of people create that indent by hitting the tab key. That is not allowed. Do we have a, a chair for you? Is that a chair? Is that a, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One more question. Yes. Is that, a, is it, did I answer your question correctly? So it's just a matter of setting the indent from the very, from page one, word one, very beginning, and then write that, don't change that margin setting at any time throughout the document. That's what I'm saying consistently. So as long as you stick to that margin in that setting throughout, you'll have no problem. So it's every time you hit return. It's it will go and create that indent for you. Yeah. If I know InDesign and I have it, can I use InDesign? Absolutely, Patrick. Okay. You go ahead and use InDesign. If you know InDesign, my God. In fact, uh, Patrick is offering his services. <laughs> 250 an hour. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> All right. Here it we was, go. It was a learning curve, trust me. Illustrations. Illustrations, absolutely. I mean, it's wonderful to have your, to, to break up the monotony of your book with illustrations. You know, and Heidi has joined us, and in, in, a, in a few 15 minutes, she's going to talk about her experience of actually doing it. So you'll hear it from someone who's really gone through the process. Uh, but we, two things you should remember. Illustrations should always be placed in text. When you put a picture in Word, it will ask you, how do you want it? You know, do you want it free-floating? Where do you want to put it? It should always be aligned in text. And remember that your book will be six by nine inches. Now, one thing you guys all love to do is create word tables. You guys love creating, I don't know why, but I haven't, I've, oh my God, so there's some dissertations with table after table, oh, we love these tables, let me tell you something. They are not allowed in any, under any circumstance. Why is that, you ask? Because they're not scalable. Everything has to go from 8 by 11 to 6 by 9, remember? So all the elements in your book need to be able to... Now, text will flow where it will go, so don't worry about the text. But if you have a, a, a table that you created in your dissertation at 8 and a half by 11, and all of a sudden it gets squished in a page 6 by 9, do you see what happens to the table? All your data gets all skewed up. And we've had so many problems with that with University Press that we finally said, sorry, they're not allowed, period. And publishers say the same thing. Figure out another way <laughs> to represent this information because it's not scalable. If it becomes an image, if, you make, if, it's, a, if, if it's translated into an image. If you make it an image as JPEG or a PNG. Right. However, when you do that, you know, if you just take a screen capture of your screen, for example, some people do that. They take a screen capture of their screen, and then you have a, an image of your table, but it gets fuzzy. There's the, the resolution is not very, very crisp. Okay, so be, be really con careful with tables. I mean, apart from the fact that tables are not really user-friendly for your average reader, I would say try to stay away from them, really. Find another way to represent that information. Uh, and of course, whatever image you use, pictures, images, have to be at least, at least, well, it says 150 DPI, I would say 300 DPI to be really uh, ready for printing. I've had uh, proofs come back from the printer saying, can't print because they're not, you know, 300 DPI. So, and make sure, of course, that you own the image. Make sure that you own the, 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 the copyright to the image. Just finding something on the internet doesn't mean that you own the image, okay? Really, because you get into a lot of trouble that way. Especially when you use photographs from contemporary things that somebody took that picture and somebody can go after you and say, hey, you used my picture, I'm gonna sue you for $5 billion. And uh, you know, what are you gonna do, you know? So be, be 
play that you have that. So again, word formatted tables are a no-no, taboo, absolutely not. Print this out, hang it over your bed. No more tables ever in my life, okay? Cannot be done, cannot be done, okay. Bibliography. I've seen articles with bibliographies that were longer than the actual text. And I understand, you're in your dissertation committee, you want to impress your committee with all the things you've read your entire life since the day you were born. Don't do that in your book. Really only cite references in your bibliography that are really useful for the reader, not some obscure journal that was published in, in you know, Kalamazoo in 1953. Let's, let's really make sure that the references are really useful. I mean, we all accept that as a scholar you've read a lot of things, but I've really gone through bibliographies of things submitted to University Press with a, with a knife and say, is this really necessary? Do we really need 20 pages of references? You know. So use your judgment. Organize it by chapter. Organize it by chapter. For this chapter, here are my references. Help the reader understand why these references, you know, don't just throw them 5,000 references at the end. It's meaningless, it really is. Just organize everything by chapter. That's what I do. I organize my end notes by chapter. I organize my references by chapter. Then it becomes really, really interesting. Uh, and of course, make sure that when you cite URLs or D DOIs, in your bibliography, make sure that they're active. Because guess what's going to happen when your book goes to an ebook? All those things become active. They become hot links. Okay? So make sure that all those references actually work before you put them in your book. And that we don't go to a page that says, you know, page not found. We've all been there. Page not found. Okay, so in summary, these are, I just Took it. I'm going to take you to one of these uh, uh, officers. So this is Blurb, blurb.com. We've used them for hardcover books. Um, I used Lulu as well, but um, I, my experience with Blurb was better. Maybe your experience will be different, but this, my, we had a good experience with these people. And you can see it's very user-friendly the way it's set up. It's very user-friendly. It's not intimidating at all. Um, and when you go there, you know, you choose photo books, trade books, magazines, e-books. Uh, we start with trade books. When you click on trade books, you get a choice of, you know, standard, premium, professional, hardcover, all the things you can do. And they all have a price. What you see on the bottom is your author price, your author price. So if you want to get a copy for yourself, that's what it costs. And of course, then you set the price in retail. Okay. Each of those come with the, 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 the formatting services. So you send them a Word document, and of course they have tips for formatting. They want your Word document to come in a certain way, but by and large is you send them a Word document, they do the layout. They do the layout. And they show you various templates of fonts and ways that the header shows up and breakdown is. And so you pick a template and they do the work for you. No stress, okay? And uh, that's, that's basically, that's how they do it. Now, this is already outdated because um, uh, CreateSpace uh, is now called KDP Amazon. KDP Amazon is for more experienced users. So KDP Amazon is our distributor for our Fielding University books. And they will offer services, but they are typically a lot more expensive. They're really designed for professional authors, professional publishers that need a distribution chain. So we just use KDP Amazon as our distribution chain. We deliver them finished layout, ready to print books from start to finish all the way through. So KDP Amazon is really for more professional users. If you use InDesign, Patrick, you should look at KDP Amazon. Uh, they're Per copy price tends to be lower than the other guys, but of course they don't offer all these services that we're, that we're talking about. Either way, whether you go with Blurp or with Lulu or with uh, Ex Libris or with everything ultimately goes into the distribution chain of Amazon 
as well as Barnes and Noble, and then you can um, select libraries and professional academic distributions as a additional add-on. Everything flows in the same distribution chain. Everything is print on demand. No inventory, no stacks of books sitting in a corner, no recalls, no re everything is, we have a customer, we print a book. That's how it goes, okay? Now, before we hand it over to Heidi, any questions about this? I know this is all very overwhelming and a lot of information, but let's quickly deal with, uh, say Adriana, then, then Marty. I have two questions. Yeah. First of all, going back to what you said about the bibliography and the acknowledgement of that chapter. My question is, do you write a chapter and then have the bibliography of that chapter right after the chapter in the end note, or at the end of the book, you say chapter one bibliography, chapter one end notes? I would say put your end notes and your references. If you write a book for the general trade, as we call it, general trade, put it all the way in the end of the book. You don't want to disrupt the flow, the logic, the narrative. If you write for a more academic audience, then you want to put your references and your end notes at the end of each chapter. So it all goes back to who is your audience. No. My second question regarding the distribution. So let's say if one of us decides to go with Blurred or Lulu. So uh, we finish the book, it's printed, we get our own copy. Then uh, it goes on Amazon, other wants to buy it, they'll print it, they'll send it out. I understand that. Now, Barnes & Nobles or local libraries, how will they have access to our book? Because when you go into Barnes & Noble, you look at the shelves. You don't look at an electronic screen. So I'm a little bit confused with that. Okay, so how Barnes and uh, how bookstores work is that uh, they get visited in the traditional publishing system, which is still active, they get visited by sales reps from the big publishers, Simon & Schuster, Random House, and so some of my books are, are sold, National Geographic. They go to these big book chains and they say, we have a book coming out by Isbouts. How many copies do you want? And they say, we'll take, we'll take 25, okay? So out of their big inventory of pre-printed books, pre-printed books of uh, five, 10,000, they ship that store on consignment, 25 copies of my book and the, 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 the deal with the publisher is that if after two or three months they can return, if my books aren't sold, they can return those copies and they go back to the distributor. That is a huge cost element, which is why books, which is why you as an author only get 5% from the whole chain. That's how books wind up on the shelf at Barnes & Noble, because there was a sales rep from Simons & Schuster who sold the book chain on a set number of copies. They accepted them on consignment. They sold half, and the other half that they didn't sell went back. So what if you go to Blur? What happens next? But So if you go through the print-on-demand system, through these channels, independent channels, it'll be very difficult for you to have a stack of copies sitting on the shelf at Barnes & Noble, because that's an entirely different business model. But it's not impossible. What I do is, uh, for books that go print on demand, I do book signings. And Barnes and Noble, I've done lots of book signings with Barnes and Noble. And you go to uh, a shop or a bookstore that in your area or that, that has a high concentration of people that might be interested in your book, you arrange for a, a and then the bookstore will order a set of books for an event like a book signing. That's how you get your books, even if it's done independently, into a bookstore. That's but for that event. That's for that event. And but again, the they're, they're on the book. let's say they bought 25 copies for your book signing. And then they're on the book. And typically you may want to uh, promise them to take any books that they haven't sold back with you. Okay. Perfect. But then again, the share of retail of the American book market is dwindling. I mean, more books are sold through the Amazon. I mean, when was the last time you went to a bookstore and I got a book? You know, I, unfortunately, I buy most of my books through Amazon because there's no more bookstores. And I must confess, mea culpa, mea culpa, that sometimes, oh, it's terrible that I say this, but sometimes I go to a bookstore 
and I take a picture of the cover. <laughs> because, you know, it's $35 versus 20 bucks, you know, and I'm a poor professor, you know. It, let me win the lottery, you know, I'll go buy all my books from a bookstore. That's, that's why bookstores are going out of business. Because this whole process of inventory and printing and storing and trucking is eliminated. Okay? I want to make sure there's enough time for... Bye-bye. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. And there's enough time for Heidi. So, uh, Marty, and a, a few more questions, then we go to Heidi. I just wonder why, why bother even putting the print book together? Why, why just do an e-book? Good question. Why do we even want pre -book, print books if we can have e-books? Well, it's mighty fine to go to a conference mm -hmm. and to hold up a copy. Mm -hmm. yes. And then to sign books at a conference. Almost all of my authors at Field University Press, we support them. When they go to a conference, we make sure there are books there for them to sign. We make flyers. That's the one thing, oh, that's the one thing. Do, would you mind if I take five more minutes, Heidi? The one thing that we have not talked about, which is the most important thing, is promotion. <laughs> promotion is everything. Just because you published a book doesn't mean you're done. Your work now starts. This is what I do. And note, these are books that were published by big public. This book was published by Random House. But I am still the one on the hook for promoting it. That's the reality in the, in the 21st century. So for this book, for example, I created this video. Oh, you probably won't be able to hear it. Well, that removes the fact, why, why go with a big publisher? <laughs> Oh, it comes out of here. Over the last decade, archaeologists have made a number of stunning discoveries about the world of ancient Israel and Egypt. That raises an important question. Are these discoveries changing the way we think about the Bible? Or can they finally resolve some of the greatest mysteries of the Old and New Testament? Anyway, we don't want to take more time. But I did this out of my own pocket. I hired an editor and we got the assets together. Publishers will expect you to do that, whether you get a 5% royalty from a big publisher or a 65% royalty from, the, we haven't even talked about that. When you go to the Amazon distribution chain, you typically get anywhere from 45 to 65% of the, the, the net rather than 5%. That is a big difference. So you can recoup the investment of your proof, of your proof, sorry, your, your copy editor, uh, your layout, these promotional videos that you're going to do, you can recoup that much faster because now from independent publishing, you're capturing almost half of the revenue uh, stream from net revenues, whereas with a traditional random house, I'm happy if I, I mean, don't get me started. I don't <laughs> want to say anything. <laughs> but getting a royalty from a traditional publisher is, is, is a lot of work, okay? So that's the last thing I want to say about. Are there any final questions before we hand it over to Heidi? Please don't hesitate. So the promotion is just a video that you I do videos and then I populate them on Vimeo, on YouTube, on Facebook, on you know, wherever I can. That's the power. I I didn't have that when I had my dissertation. You guys have that power. That's a whole different seminar. But typically if you talk about a book, you want to use video. And you can do podcasts, audio. But populate, use all these social media. That, that doesn't cost anything. It costs your out of pocket to produce it, yes. But that's a separate seminar. I mean, I, I have a, a jihadi uh, microphone that I use for my podcasts. I have a camera that I use for my video podcast. Use it, use it, use it. Promotion is everything to make us a success. I have one question. Yes. Um, would you use your book sort of as a magnet to to um, get invited to do large conferences and seminars and things of that sort? Or is the book sort of, um, or is the book sort of the end all be all? The, the book is your entry card into the conference circuit, okay? Got it. You, you want to say, when you pitch a paper to a conference, you will say, uh, I'm the author of. Available at Amazon. I mean, that is your entry because that is a credit that validates your role as a scholar practitioner. That's how we started this conversation. 
Books validate your ability to present because you've published a book about it. Okay? All right, thank you guys. And now on to our next speaker, Heidi. Self-promotion. Here we go. Heidi's going to actually has done it. So she's going to tell you how it's she not did. Not on the shelves, and you'll notice that a lot of the times the books that you're looking for aren't on the shelves anyway. Um, and it's usually pretty quick. The print on demand, they you know they're able to get it for you within a week. So um, it's usually not a problem if um, if you're not on the bookshelves. Again, it depends on what your intention is with your publishing. Um, I made the mistake of, uh, you know, just sort of a beginner's mistake of publishing my dissertation after my first book. I was having a conversation with Adriana, yeah, Adriana, today earlier, and and saying how I wish I'd published it first. The reason I published my dissertation was because I referred to it in my book, um, and people were asking me how do I get access to it. Well, you know, not many, unless you're a scholar or involved in some academic institution, you really don't have ac access to people's dissertations. And it's not necessarily that I published it so that everybody would read it, but those that wanted, wanted to have access to, to it could get it. And the other thing, but had I done it first, then when my book came out that was, you know, that was sort of building on my dissertation, I would already have been a published author. So it would have been my second book, which from a branding perspective is really powerful. So there's some little tricks to it that, I mean, it doesn't matter if anybody reads that first book, quite frankly. <laughs> um, you know, hopefully you'll buy, you know, five copies for your family and friends anyway, so there'll be some purchases there. Um, but you are the expert in that field, and that's the other thing, is that I waited a year to publish my book, and it was a very current, you know, it was about wearables. This is... I read your dissertation. Oh, you did. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I mean, it was about wearables, and wearables five years ago is very different from wearables today. So, it, I should have published it right as soon as I got it back. And the beautiful thing is, after you finish your dissertation and it's been approved, it's already been edited. It's already been formatted. All you have to do is format it for publishing it. And so, all the dirty work is done. Um, and so that's a really easy, you know, you have to create a cover for it and, you know, there's services that will do that. It sounds like you, the, the one that you mentioned would have been perfect. I wish I had done that instead of struggling, trying to format it myself and do all that. But um, there are also great services and, um, and coaches out there that will work with you if you want to do the whole process of learning how to get it onto KDP, do the formatting. They'll even coach you through the process of writing your book if you need that. Um, I found for me, it was really helpful because it, uh, it gave, helped me provide the structure of how to produce my book because I had a sort of, you know, post PhD brain where I just had too many thoughts going in my head, but I couldn't really formulate them into something that normal non-academic readers could understand. And it, what, what I found was uh, sort of the, the path to understanding what is the same thing that I, the beginning foundational piece that I give to every single person that I work with or every organization and every workshop that I do, what's that foundational piece that doesn't change? And that was the piece that needed to be in a book because then I could get into the deeper stuff when I worked with clients. So to me, it wasn't about making money from the book. It was basically creating a workbook that I can use when I work with my clients. And you know, by using something like Ingram Spark, I can, when I, when I go do a keynote, I can pre-order a case of books and have them sent to the location. They're there, they're ready for me to be able to, to do a signing. Sometimes when they hire me to do a keynote, they'll, they'll offer to buy a case of books and have me do a signing. They love being able to do that and they'll do a giveaway and have, you know, books on everybody's seats. There's lots of different ways that, that you can help sort of promote the book, but it also becomes sort of an added value to you as a speaker. Um, so there was a lot of different little pieces, but the book is just a part of the mix. I mean, for me, being an author is not really who I am. It, it's just one of the ways that I communicate my message. So I have a podcast, and that's also a way I communicate my message. And the podcast feeds future books because I use some of the stories and the interviews from my podcasts to, you know, to tell the stories and to tell the examples within the books. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of it sort of feeds into it. And 
content, for example. There's so many great tools that you can use that you can capture your voice and have it just automatically go to dictation mode and you actually have your entire interview right there and all you have to do is edit and there's a chapter for you. Um, so there's a lot of different tricks around how to get your content out but also how to get it out to your audience but you have to be really clear on and this I wasn't so clear on when my first book came out was who is my audience because you have to write for that audience and um, the criticism or the critique that I got for my first book was it's it's too it's too academic in the language because I I focused on the theory and I wanted to make sure everybody understood the theoretical background behind what I was trying to to show them on sort of the different personality types and they didn't care they didn't really I mean that part was just it was overwhelming for them and 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 it was in a chart so you'll notice if you take a look at this that this one has this one has it in a chart and that was the other thing, so it had to be done in a, you know, I had to turn it into a photo or into, a, in, into an image, and then the image had to be aligned to make sure that it went on the right page so you didn't end up with, you know, <laughs> some sort of skipping a page so that it would accommodate it or blank pages within it. Also, the second book, it was making sure there was room for white space for people to take notes and to play around with the, with the content and to make sure that each chapter ended with questions to make them think about what they learned in the chapter. But that was just the format of my book, but it was sort of the lessons from it. And I think the biggest lesson that I've learned about writing books is that when you're finished with it, you hate it. And <laughs> you're like, oh God, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to even promote this book anymore. I'm kind of done with it. It's kind of like your dissertation. You don't want to see it again for another year. Um, the same thing will happen with your books, but doesn't matter. You, that's when you really have to get out there and, and push it, and, and it doesn't matter because people are gonna love it. The right people are gonna love it. The other piece is, you know, depending on how your, what, what your purpose of, of your book is, it's not about how many people buy your book, it's about who is buying your book. Because if you get it to the right person, get it into the right hands, it's gonna make all the difference in the world. And that, that right client, and that maybe you print that one version, you order that one version, a hardcover from Amazon, and you have it sent to your ideal client with a personal note saying, I wrote this for you. Check out page 36. How do you think they feel about that? Besides the fact you send it to them from Amazon in a gift-wrapped package, nobody, that goes by any secretary, anything. It's, you know, it goes right to the top. Everybody loves getting presents. But there's, you know, it's about finding the right match for your message and finding the best way to distribute it. And I found that the books have been a really great source for that. And I, I promised a couple people that asked me, actually two of them aren't even here, but um, to find... Uh, the best name for for coaches that will work for um, th that'll work for doing the content and alignment and everything if you want to work with someone directly for that because the person I worked with is no longer doing it but he had a whole bunch of mentees that that he was working under so I just I, before I go referring I